So I'm sorry. <laughs> Charlie's here. Randy's here. I'm doing the introductions. How about that, everybody? Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Uh, all right. So, uh, sorry. I'm sorry. Charlie Dunlap. From Charlie Lassina. Dunlap here. All present. Oh, that's right. Randy Brown, DPW Director. Uh, Eric Lerner from PVPC. Uh, Ken Comia from PVPC. Uh, oh. Am I even on the list? Because I, I don't can go over there. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Is, is that the real problem? Uh, anyways. Um, I'm sorry, Sabrina Pooler, uh, the, the conservation um, agent. We've got Dennis Clark, uh, my former conservation agent and current. Uh, I think there's other involvement. Pardon me, Dennis, for not getting all your uh, qualifications uh, straight. But nonetheless, uh, he's online. And still with us? I think he's still with us. I think so. That's that's what it is. Um, or maybe he retired. Then. And as I mentioned, Kevin Fuller from the Conservation Commission, who uh, I've invited him to share his comments afterwards. Uh, so, anyways, welcome everybody to today's discussion. Online participants, uh, right now we just have uh, Dennis, uh, and of course we have some um, wonderful people in the public, including uh, Marcus Phelps uh, from the Master Plan Advisory Committee. Uh, so, with that brief rundown, which was mostly for me to make sure that uh, we had uh, folks here, uh, the majority um, of those invited. Um, Ken uh, and Eric, I'll turn it over to you to uh, to guide the discussions. Sure. Before I turn it over to Eric, I just want to welcome everyone to our final focus group. Yeah. <laughs> our, our climate and resilience um, Sad day. Um, focus group. And the thing with our focus groups that we've we've learned from the community is that there's lots of overlap and a lot of the issues, and they're all somewhat related to each other. And I think you'll find. Um, with the line of questions this this morning, as well as the conversations that may be happening with regards to this particular issue um, that seems to just keep evolving with the climate changing, um, that you'll see that there are um, strategies in here that can can be um, can be uh, recommended for all of the various elements of the plan. So um, I'm here to take notes, but I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Erica, who's going to lead the discussion. All right. Nice to meet everybody. Um, lots of people's faces I've seen on Zoom, but haven't had the chance in person in a while. Um, so I think that before we start today, um, the idea of climate resiliency and sustainability, that there's two important definitions to, to keep in mind, and that is that resiliency is the ability to respond, absorb, and adapt to, as well as recover in this disruptive event. So resiliency is basically the ability for anything or our infrastructure to withstand an extreme event or to recover quickly from it. Um, so the minimal impacts during an extreme event. And sustainability is defined as meeting the needs of the present generation without jeopardizing the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So how do we meet our, our current needs without using up all the resources for the future? Um, so it, with those things in mind, could you guys give me a general overview of the town's attitudes and perceptions towards climate resiliency and sustainability? Have you seen any changes or trends in the last few years? Do, you know, do people believe that they are significant issues in this town? Um, what would you say is the attitude towards these projects and ideas? Um, I would say because of our droughts that we've had in the past few years mm -hmm. and the issues with water, um, that's something that people have been bringing up, especially with like new developments, any big projects that come away. Water seems to be part of that discussion. Uh, I would chime in regarding that, though. Uh, I agree, right? It's always an issue. But if we're talking about the town's willingness to respond, I know there are plans from DPW to they're trying to address that through the state. So I don't think that's something that's just not being addressed from a town standpoint. Uh, and if you go around town right now, you look at all the work being done along the power lines. I think from a town standpoint, we're trying to make sure we're hedging our bets for any large storms that come down the road that, you know, we'll be able to continue to get power. Uh, and more importantly to the younger generation, the internet, right? So yeah. people continue to work from home and stuff. Yeah, 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 exactly. yeah, yeah. It's very important yeah, to me too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, our age group and younger. 
Yeah. Uh, so I think the town understands from a resilient standpoint what needs to be done to make sure that you know we can continue to operate in an emergency. Sustainability may be a different question. And what do you think about the the residents in town, your your citizens here? Um, do you feel like that they are take have, hold the same um, goals and that they value these projects as much as the town is valuing them? I'm going to chime in about the the um, upkeep with the trees along the, especially South, was it South Long Yard? Oh, yeah, that yeah. was just done. I happened to be scrolling on Facebook and there was people like applauding our DPW director basically saying, oh. yes, great, thank you, you know, proactive, because that, that was before the storm. So, so, so they hadn't even seen damage and they were really excited that there was proactive actions taken mm -hmm. to prevent further like storm damage and that's a really great attitude, mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know how much awareness is, there is amongst the population on the, you know, sustainability and those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. One thing, uh, notice, and probably, hopefully people notice, maybe uh, the lakes don't freeze over anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, we had very little ice this year, and I think the year before, so it's like no more ice fishing contests. Uh, I don't know how you know, much that'll change, but there seems to be that a pattern there. And of course, the people that live on the lake, maybe they have more interest in that. I don't know. I'm, you know, I don't have contact with those people, but to me, that's a, a big thing to see that. I don't know. Charlie, you've been here many years in Southwick. Have you ever fished on, on the lake? Ice yes. Fishing? Okay. Um, I'll add to to what Marcus just said. I'm old enough to see cycles, and it looks like there's deep cycles, whether it be cold, hot, drought, wet seasons. I, I can relate to the 55 flood where the lakes drained completely. I've been ice fishing on the lakes back in uh, 1955, uh, 50, Oh, let's see, when was it? It was 54 or so. And I have to agree with Marcus that uh, the lakes haven't frozen over. I like to do ice fishing and haven't been able to in the last couple of years. Back in the 60s, we had one heck of a drought. And it was forest fire problems that everybody was aware of. And then we go into, we're back into a drought the last couple of years where it was very dry. So I see things in cycles, and the cycles appear to be maybe even a little bit deeper in, in either uh, lows or highs. So, and so as, you're seeing more extreme as, weather events, more extreme yes, weather. Yep. And I'm, I'm very much aware of natural disasters and weather. I work very close with national weather. So uh, I just have to say that we're into a cycle. Now, as far as my uh, thoughts on people, residents here in town, I think they're uh, just complacent and not really too much in concern. I'd like to see, you know, them being a little bit more concerned of, mm -hmm. of the climate and uh, conservation. Would you say that they tend to respond after an issue, you know, arises that then they notice it? Um, for instance, like the MVP planning was saying that people were worried about outdoor recreation being um, continuing, and I imagine, you know, the ice fishing being part of it. Um, would you say that people are like noticing when the trees fall on the electrical lines, then they're concerned about it. When they can't go ice fishing, then they're concerned about it, but less proactive, is that? The concern right now is not so much outdoor activities. Mm -hmm. Everything is internet, um, video, video conferencing, social media. That appears from the younger generation on. It's a whole different lifestyle. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't think our town is really significantly different than a lot of times i think mm -hmm. people are pretty apathetic they don't do anything until they have to mm -hmm. right yeah and i don't think that's you know um isolated in southwick right it's not a problem until it's a problem and most people won't get involved until they're mm -hmm. directly impacted right yep. so mm -hmm. if you're looking at people trying to be proactive to kind of stem off some of these things you can come to any town meeting and you see the same faces you know, and I, and again, I'm, that's no different than any town. So, 
you know, if some other town has figured out a way to get more community involvement without it being a, you know, uh, five alarm fire, I'd love to hear what they're doing. But right now we just seem to be, you know, just everything's fine until it's not. Yeah, and I, and I think you're right. It's very much like many, many, many other towns. And if there's one out there that has figured out how to do it better, I'd like that answer too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah. Um, all right, so in terms of resilience, there were some repeated concerns in the MVP workshop about the town's infrastructure, such as lack of air conditioning at the schools, the need for substantial and costly renovations of the DPW facility, um, whole based electrical and communication lines, things like that. Um, what has been your experience with how the town has been withstanding the extreme weather events? Are schools closing due to the heat? Has the DPW been able to effectively work during snowstorms or heavy rain events? Are there problems with power outages? Um, and what goals do you think the town should set for improving its ability, uh, the, its infrastructure's ability to withstand um, extreme events? So I'll, I'll start here. I, I think we've overall, I think we do pretty well in these categories. Um, as far as our operations during snow events, we, you know, we um, certainly our guys are out there as soon as the snow starts and we're, we're done when it's over. Um, we do see uh, an uptick in uh, damage to vehicles when you get that wet, heavy snow. And we've mm -hmm. seen a lot of those, you know, especially the last two storms have been the wet, heavy snow. Um, when you're trying to push more weight, that's when you see the damage to not only our vehicles, but also to the roads itself. Mm -hmm. um, I did want to note the, in the MVP report at that point, we did not have any backup power at the DPW facility, but that has now been, we do have that facility, we do have that um, in place now. Oh, that's great. Um, and then as far as the electrical, yeah, so I love to take credit for the work on South Lillingard Road, but that's really all through Eversource. Uh, um, well, that was the one with that you got, yeah. you, got, you got applauded for it. That's Trying really, to throw your bone, Randy. Yeah, I know, I know. They, they have been very active in town, and we have a great relationship with Eversource, and uh, that product on South Lillingard Road is an example. Um, that's one of their backbones, um, that, that route, so that's why they've been probably going a little more extensive on South Long or then they have another roads in town. Yeah, they're pretty far back off the poles. But but that said, they we've had a great relationship with them over the years and every time we have a tree that we think is um potential impact to take take down a wire, um, they take a look at it and in a lot of cases they will take it. Um and even though it's a town tree, they'll take it at their cost. So we I think that has gone gone a long way. Um that last storm, you know, we had some power outages, but I think overall we've actually paired fairly pretty well. You know, we had a lot of isolated events, you know, twenty houses here, thirty houses here, five houses here. It wasn't a town wide uh, outage. And I think the outage was actually pretty short in duration compared to other communities as well. Um, it's been a long time since we had a big outage event. It has a really long time. Mm -hmm. I mean we've not done simulated work. You know, we've been pretty lucky. I'll say a couple things from the planning board standpoint. Uh, we haven't had any new gas stations come in, although Pride down in Gillette's Corner was redone. And uh, we require a generator at the gas station so they can pump gas uh, if there's a power outage. And also in the subdivisions, the power lines are underground. Of course, that doesn't prevent power lines that are coming to the subdivision that are on poles from going down, but at least uh, I guess both aesthetically and uh, functionally underground is uh, useful. I guess there's different opinions on that, uh, maintenance and so forth of underground mm -hmm. systems. I don't know, Randy, maybe you know. Cost, yeah, yeah. 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 It's the biggest factor. Cost. But don't they, like we just had in our development, <clears throat> Was it last year or the year before where they came through and they ran all new electricity to all the houses and I think Comcast kind of glommed down to the back of that. You guys put that pavement top around it. But isn't that cost incurred by the, the utilities? Utilities, yeah. You, utilities are also bringing that, that cost, yeah. correct. Or, or if it's a, um, well, the new development that's on the, on the, the, the developer, the developer, the burden. Right. Well, and do you guys think there's any goals the town should be setting to improve its ability to withstand the extreme events? It sounds like a lot of the things during the MVP workshop have actually had some progress with being addressed. 
Um, is there anything that you think should be um, added on, something that should be highlighted as a goal for improving the infrastructure's resiliency? Yeah, so I'll chime in. I mean, we have one, two, and a proposed third large solar array going on in the town. And I don't believe we're tapping into that at all. And I would love to see us take advantage of that and possibly take advantage of a lot of the flat rooftop rooftops that we have, primarily at the schools, to you know pull in as much solar energy as possible. And you know, when we're talking about backups, right? Instead of running generators, is there an opportunity to run some of that stuff to batteries so that if the power goes out, that there's still power going to those um, facilities? So I would I would love to see us look a little bit more at alternative energies mm -hmm. from a town standpoint, just to give us options. I'd like to see the town continue being proactive for culverts under roads for uh, mm -hmm. for streams. We've been doing very well, and I'd like to see us continue. I second that. Yeah. <laughs> are you guys doing All the okay. DER culvert replacement grants? We are, we are. So I can uh, talk about that. So in my nine years here, uh, we've replaced I think five or six culverts, um, and we kind of have a like have a back order. So we we've been using these programs like MVP, DER small bridge programs uh, to fund the designs and ultimate construction of these culverts. So we have I think five or six that we've done so far. We have one that. Uh, that is uh, has been designed on Klein Road and ready to go. It's basically like a shovel ready project. Um, we have one that's we're designing now on Granville Road. It's a Tuttle Brook Culver Cross. Actually, it's a bridge crossing on Granville Road. Um, and then we're actually applying for a DER grant um, for another design. So Fantastic. we're kind of keeping the queue, and then as money comes available, we'll. We'll come off the shelf and construct it. Again. That's yeah. perfect. That's yeah. excellent. And there's plenty to go. It's not, you know, I listed off, you know, there's eight or nine there that, you know, we've worked on or done, but there's four times that out there that, you know, we uh, we could consider. So it's like, I mean, a never ending process. And the problem is, you know, the cost is very, very high. Um, you know, so to do one culvert is, you know, several hundred thousand dollars, if not upwards of a million dollars, depending on the severity of it. Yeah. And very few of them are the same size. They are now much, much bigger with the increased flows and yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah. So yep. You gotta meet the street flow standards, you know, accommodate uh, any fish and wildlife that want to pass through that culvert. Um, so yeah, they're they are bigger in size for sure. You yeah. can't just put a pipe in the ground and you want to call it culvert. No. <laughs> I wanna make a comment on change mm -hmm. years ago school buses used to have chains and schools never closed now cars have lower clearance to the road so it's more significant for the dpw to keep the roads plowed where six eight inches of snow was nothing we'd drive through it so times have changed people have gotten a lot wimpier <laughs> i'll tell it like it is quote it it's going in the report. People are wimpier. <laughs> Quotes right there. Yep. Uh, so it's just a, a time of, of life. You know, that schools are closed when schools used to be open. And now with affecting this community, we're regionalized. So there's microclimate changes between here mm -hmm. over the hill into the Loomis Valley from the Loomis Valley into Granville from Granville into West Granville into Tolland Tolland and Granville are part of the regional school system so that does affect us it makes a lot of sense in this last storm that we had we had 25 percent power outage in this community Granville had close to probably 100 percent the rest of the hill towns the same thing so the microclimate microclimate from the connecticut valley river valley just over the the proven mountain suffield ridge to us is a little different in temperature 
elevation. So that does affect us. And, yeah, and so you find that the school closings See, can I, be dictated drove, by other towns yeah, as well. I yeah. had the Tallinn school bus run for about 12 years. So I used to see the microclimates as you go west, the damage mm -hmm. from storm damage. So, so we're fortunate being flatlanders here in Southwick. Flatlanders, <laughs> I like that. Mm. That's a good one. Mm. Right. So, and you guys have started to mention the, the hazard trees in town already, and like many other towns, there's the health of the trees is declining um, uh, due to pests and changes in weather and climate. Um, I'm wondering, what's been your policy to date for managing the hazard trees, and has it been a planned management effort, or has it been more responding when there's a problem? And how do you think we sh you should move forward with sub sustainably managing the hazard trees? Because it will continue to, de you know, more will develop, but funding is um, hard to come by. Well, I'll make a comment on that. A few years ago, under Western Mass Electric, we had a real good relationship. And that paid off under Snowtober, where we took in Western Mass Electric. We were down without power for seven, eight days just south of us at Connecticut border, they were down for two weeks. And then working with Eversource, we have a real good relationship. I do with Joe Mitchell and I'm sure Randy and uh, does. So I will say the relationship with the, the major electric utility uh, is very positive and I hope it continues. Yeah, I'll second what Charlie said. Um, and then as far as our policy goes, I mean, I would say we're more reactive than proactive. Mm -hmm. I'd love, love to be the opposite, but uh, you know we have limited funds. Um, you know I think our budget for tree removal is around thirty thousand, thirty-five thousand dollars a year. Oh, that's nothing. Which I could spend on <laughs> one given street right mm -hmm. right now. Yeah. So yeah, it's not it's not it's not high. So that's one of the reasons why we try to partner with EverSource so often because you know they'll take a lot of these trees at at no cost to the town. Um, but for trees that are hazards, um, we try to be proactive as best we can. We have to prioritize, obviously. Um, the way we do our tree work is uh, we'll identify a, a group of trees. So actually, we have a bid out right now for tree removal. I think there's 50 or 60 trees on the list. They're all marked out in the, in the field, in the streets. And then we have a contractor come in and they'll give us a price to remove all, all you know, 50 or 60 of those trees. And hopefully we're in we're within our budget. Um, yeah, but I think other I, I think we actually do very well in that setup. Um, I know other communities they just have a blanket tree contract. It's you know paid by the hour, and I think I think we're able to get more bang for a buck through that process. I, I've seen that for sure, so I would definitely second that. Um, but yeah, I, I wish we could change that somehow. Um, you know, I do get calls, Sabrina gets calls from residents quite often about trees, damaged trees, diseased trees that are on their property. It may not be in the right of way, but on private property. And we try to follow up with them and, and let them know what uh, what their options are. Uh, but yeah, it is it is it is an issue. Um, I don't know. I don't know how best address it though. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and are you seeing in conservation lands, are you seeing any die off of some of these species? Do you have any um, concerns about like dead wood? Um, you know, because we've actually seen a few uh, forest fires in the state in the last few years when it really wasn't a concern previously. Um, <clears throat> have you, are you seeing any, you know, accumulation of dead and dying trees um, in the open space areas? I don't, I don't think any more than Typical. I mean, I don't mm -hmm. see a lot more deadfall than I have in the past when I'm hiking. Yeah, and like if you, if I do see a dead tree, I kind of get excited. I'm like, oh yay! Like for woodpeckers and yeah, insects. Yeah, because yeah, a lot of times those that dead wood gets cleaned out like on private property, so right, it's right. sort of like a valuable <laughs> resource for us. But um, as far as like fire hazards. I mean, we're lucky with get, we have like a lot of wet areas, so yep. not a lot of like significant die offs. Um, and I don't necessarily have a keen eye right now for noticing a specific species not doing as well. I know there's some um, things happening with beach that 
I've been learning about maybe this year I'll be able to point it out like oh we have this issue with um, I, I forgot it's like a nematode um, in the beech leaves um, but yeah I, I we're very low on Christmas trees. We need to replenish <laughs> yes, okay, our uh, Christmas inventory of Christmas okay. trees. Yeah, right, we could right, just right. note that. That would be great. <laughs> yeah. I, don't, I don't think there's ever been a, a forest health yeah. assessment for the town. No. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, ash is dying off completely. I was with a uh, forester yesterday, and uh, he said, if you see an ash, cut it, because it's going to be dead in a couple of years. So uh, theoretically, with the temperatures warming, you get more disease and insects. I mean, the uh, gypsy moth has been uh, down for most you know years. When that's around, the maples get whacked pretty hard. Well, just about anything. They'll eat hemlock. They'll eat you know oak leaves. Uh, but uh, that's been pretty quiet. So I don't know if that's temperature might, related. I think they might be on the rise. But the ash are definitely, definitely on their way out. Last summer there was, a, I think, a wilt on a lot of oak trees. Mm -hmm. Actually, mm -hmm. it was a brown. Like you see a lot of like grouping of leaves that are just brown and hanging. Yeah. Um, I don't know what if that may have been related to the drought last summer. I'm not sure, but that's something that was noticeable around town. We had talked about at least on the town property, the conservation areas, right, doing a forest cutting plan and what have you mm -hmm. and we had one of the local foresters in for a different reason and we discussed it and it just we didn't really follow up on it it's probably not a bad idea mm -hmm. to kind of circle back around and see what we can do about that because uh, we do have some significant sized pieces of property in town that are owned by the town for conservation purposes and it would be good to be able to keep those as healthy as possible mm -hmm. and a cut can bring funds in for the town as well as you know, pro provide habitat value with diversity and things yeah. like that. Yeah, um, and there are some grant programs to actually have a forester do the the cuts. I'm uh, sorry, do the plans for you guys. So yeah, feel free to ask me later. Feel Probably. free to send over any link you have. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll let you know what I ha what, what, yeah where you can find to get the plan actually funded, and then you would have a, a logger um, implement it. So um, the most actively managed piece in Southwick is the North Pond. Uh, not the town part, but the uh, state area over there generated some interest when they harvested some uh, timber this year, I guess, mm -hmm. right? Between that and the fires, the phones were buzzing. Because they're trying to create, what, some uh, certain kind of habitat down there. Yep. Uh, more of a, more prairie, of a, it's more prairie. like a gradual, because uh, it was basically like a hard line between like prairie, grassland, and then forest. So then they want, I, I'm pretty sure they want like that gradual transition over. So they got rid of a lot of the pines and left and the, the oak. They wanted an oak forest there. Yeah, yeah. underbrush. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because um, the pines aren't native. They want to get rid of as many of the white pines over there as possible because it's just really, they say it's not really a native species. I'm not sure if they're not native, but they're, they're a pioneering species. So they kind of take over mm -hmm. disturbed areas, especially. Um, and I think they're trying to also improve the the oak forest because that's sort of like i think it's in decline the oak forest yeah, i don't know well and sometimes they pick different areas to highlight like the um the herman covey for instance they're doing harvests and specifically leaving pine trees to create pine barrens for like wicker wills and things like that so mm -hmm. it's very yeah it's very interesting they pick different areas to manage yeah. for different um habitats but yeah Interesting. But what you're saying about the Christmas trees um, mm -hmm. gave me another thought. Uh, do you guys have any kind of um, program where if you take a tree, one gets replaced? Do you have any plans for how you might continue to, you know, provide for mature trees 40 years from now? Because um, if we need to take them all down, or a good substantial portion of them, we're losing a lot of tree cover. Is there any kind of thoughts on that? Whether it's yeah. happening, whether it should happen? Yeah, Randy. Yeah, Randy. That's, what, what, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a conservation. Yeah, he's like, he's like, I gotta take down this tree. And I'm like, no, don't. Our forest warden does not plant trees. He does not plant trees. Either not plant trees <laughs> so I did have this conversation where I said, I wish we had a plot of land somewhere when whenever a municipality thing, you know, they have to take down a tree for whatever reason, I understand trees need to come down, they, they, that we plant something. Um, 
Make a nice field. Though, I know, right? Um, but then there's that where what plot of land is that going to be? And you know, um, for me, I'm thinking these are a lot of these are mature trees. They're mm -hmm. carbon sequenters, and when we cut them down, essentially the carbon you know is going to be more readily available to get back into the atmosphere. If we plant a little tree, that's not a carbon sequencer. It actually emits a bit of carbon, and it takes years before you know it becomes more productive as far as air quality. Um, so it hurts. It hurts when they get cut down. They're so pretty, and like we love giant trees, right? But it, they're not being really kept on private property necessarily, at least in mm -hmm. the smaller lots. And then we have all these big trees on the right of ways because no one cuts them down until they're like a hazard. So it's tough seeing those trees being cut. But well, Concon does have a shovel. policy now, right? So any tree that comes before the board or commission? Yeah, within within our- The buffer zone. The buffer zone, if, it, if it's an emergency um, uh, emergency certification removal. So if it's a it's a hazard to a person or their or the property, and we say yes, you can take it down. Actually, even the other tree that wasn't necessarily a hazard, they just wanted to take it down. So we said, okay, you know, just replace it with another native. I don't know how effective it is because you know we tell them to do it. I need to do some follow up because it's springtime now. They should be planting. Yeah. Um, but that's what we've been trying to do. That's a good policy. I like that. But I would like every time we cut down a tree <laughs> right away, we plant something. The intern can follow up on town, on on town all of those. <laughs> Yeah, no, trying to get. Is there. is that is that in your conditions of approval to cut down that tree in your emergency? Yeah, I do. I do write it in the emergency. Okay. Just like you know, a condition. Please. What, is it just emergency, or would it be a condition for like a, the NNOI project as well, or any other? RDA or so product. for NOI, we don't necessarily say we, we, we have, put we put it's, it's not on every, their it's not yeah every, it's on like their plan that they say we're going to put planting so that's you know they need to go by the plan um, and then whether or not they follow the plan down the road that's a different story but um, we had an RDA with a negative determination and then with that was a condition to to replant. Mm -hmm. um, because trees, they do, they get too big and then they do become a hazard and it's understandable that they want to take them down. Um, Mostly it's because it's disturbing their sight line. That's yeah. when we make it a little harder for them to take it down. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's blocking your view. Well, you're going to have to work for it. That's what vista pruning is for. You don't well, have to yeah. down. You could just People have a hard time wrapping themselves around the whole vista pruning. Yeah. Yep. Yep. You know? on, like you have like the topography where it's, you know, the house is up here and then there's the hill. And so really tall trees, you can't really vista prune. You kind of have to yeah. vista prune the top. Yeah. You get a top we actually just and had that's an instance just... where he's like, so I can, I can take the tops off. We're like, wait, no, 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 you kill the tree. I don't, don't do that. <laughs> it hurts my soul. Remind me of your instance of Western Field. I'm trying to be like, very quiet over here. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do that. Yeah. Oh, all right, I could talk about trees for ages, but I have yeah, to move on from them because I really could. <laughs> all right. Um, so the town's hazard mitigation plan has a focus on flooding, be it whether or not people are concerned about still water rise from water bodies or failures of infrastructure like culverts or stormwater BMPs. Um, can you guys talk to me a bit about the mapped FEMA flood risk areas? Um, it, you know, the hazard mitigation plan talked about educating residents. Um, do most people not really know about flood zones and the homeowners insurance requirements for that? Is there a substantial amount of people who don't have mortgages in those areas that wouldn't? Because if you have a mortgage, it'd be a required mm -hmm. um, insurance. So I'm just wondering, is, is that a gap that you guys are seeing or is that um, just general good practice, the idea? The floodplain manager or um, <clears throat> coordinator for the town is our building inspector. Okay. I work along with FEMA, and most of the people don't realize where the floodplains are. And the Loomis, Loomis area, north and south, Loomis are one, and around the lakes are number two. So people are probably not aware of the floodplains and the floodplain insurance. 
Right. Yeah, I'll second what Charlie said. I think people are not aware. I think they're only aware when their insurance company tells them. Yeah. And they were not aware prior to. When they find out that they have and, to pay more. Yeah. 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 Okay. And I don't think that I don't think the town is all is at all proactive in educating the public. That's probably an area where we probably could look at it and, and make some improvements. Now, floodplains. I work closely with. Springfield and Westfield on the two earthen dams and the reservoirs to our west. And we meet, and my concern is when we have a forecasted heavy rainstorm or significant weather event, that they start draining down the Granville Reservoir and Cobble Mountain. Because uh, being earth, earthen dams, we've already had spillway problems. Mm -hmm. So, and that comes into our floodplain area and the Loomis Street areas. So you think that, and, and I apologize because I missed the opening portion of the sentence, you would like them to lower them prior to a storm? Is well, that, or that it's that, been a problem? That's being, no, that's being proactive. And, okay, yep, yep. And working with the awareness that uh, if you can draw it down to three inches or so, if you've got a, uh, say, for instance, a uh, hurricane event coming up the coast where we're liable to get four, five, six, eight inches, and and the reservoirs are already brim full. Making sure that they're at a lower status and, prior to the big event that yes. we can predict. That's a great one, yeah. And along with that is ice jams. We don't have any <clears throat> significant problems with ice jams, but they do on the uh, branch of the Westfield River where they have to dynamite them if there's significant uh, ice buildup. Oh, wow. And one year that they forgot to dynamite them, or the, the person in charge of it was on vacation. And I got called in to uh, document, and I'll tell you, that was scary, seeing these huge icebergs across the river. And when the ice started shifting, it was like he real heavy thunder. Oh, wow. And it was about ready to take out the railroad tracks plus the bridges downstream. Now, I don't know if we have any culverts that would be subject to that here in town, I don't really think so. I can't think of any that would be where there's a, the water would be so, the volume of water would create an iceberg so big that it would, it would create impacts. I can't think of any. Else. So have you guys, um, have you had an updated FEMA map in the last few years? I, I know that they were working on releasing them. Do you guys have, or your uh, flood zone maps still from like the 80s or 90s? I'm not sure. Uh -huh. I haven't seen any come across my desk. I think the shift to the electronic version was a 2013 or 18 or whatever it was, was strictly, you know, an overlay from my perspective. Yep, yep. I mean, yep. Uh, so I don't think there's been, and but even they this year, I think there was a notice yet. out of my mail saw it. Um, and I forget which branch of a river, that, whatever they were doing further studies on. Uh, I did a quick you know, walkthrough and didn't see any fundamental change um, to South Park. So I don't think there's been anything recent. Okay. All right. I think they're supposed to come out like this any, year. This like year. Any day. Yeah. I mean, really? Yeah. Because yeah. some, of, some of the communities up north have been going through a planning process where FEMA has been coming to the town and saying, your boundaries are changing significantly. Wow. There's going to be a lot more properties at the flood point. Yeah, because it was like three years ago they started doing the right. the, the, the meetings about it. And, so. and they're, Yeah, and they're requiring towns to start moving on the amending their flood plain bylaws. Um, Interesting. Mm -hmm. ah, so it sounds like that might be something that would be a future coming. goal, would be to make sure that people are aware of any changing the new mm -hmm. map lines, you know, mm -hmm. um, and then line change awareness um and then yeah and then i wanted to ask um so the floodplain bylaw that's to be required um is that regarding like building codes things like that it's a lot um of um it's the so fema is requiring for all communities that participate in national flood insurance program to change their bylaws so they reflect what FEMA has as this model or MEMA. Um, and there's really nothing with regards to the standards in there. It's more so the, the types of uses that are allowed within the floodplain, which is minimal, things that can be moved very easily mm -hmm. um, and, and the like. But I didn't see, I don't recall seeing anything with regards to like 
you know, um, anything built over a certain flood elevation or anything like that it should. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I might be. I have to review that. But right. I do recall that they were changing some of the, the types of uses that could be allowed in the floodplain um, because recently Hadley has had to go through a process of amending this and it became a big thing because the recreation areas that were impacted were now all in the floodplain and the definition of like a trailer versus a mobile home versus that was all drawn into question. So it became oh, wow. a very big um, contentious item for the town. I mean, that does sound to me, that sounds like something that'd be coming up and, and might be worth mentioning in this chapter of the comprehensive comprehensive plan. Yeah, I don't see much of an impact here in, in this town. In this area. For the, for, that the flooding won't happen for, as much? Well, it's always there. It's, you know, it's, you have to plan for it, but I don't think, you know, as far as bylaw changes or anything. You don't think it'll be a problem? I, I don't think so. That's, an, that's good to hear. Yeah. Um, what about, uh, <clears throat> let's see, because I think we just kind of got into the next little two thoughts already. Um, and regarding the infrastructure related flooding, um, what are the goals on sustainable, sustainably funding culvert replacements? We've talked about DER, um, dam maintenance, stormwater BMPs, and general housekeeping. Um, how are you guys looking at doing those things, funding them? What are your thoughts for the future? So as far as dams go, there are very few dams in Southwick. Um, I have a list, it's probably less than 10. And are they state listed? They are, I mean, most of them, I think all of them are privately mm -hmm. owned. And privately owned, yeah. okay, so none owned by the town. No, no, no okay. town owned dams. All right. None that I know that would really impact the town as far as flooding or... Uh... I mean, I, I think, I, like Charlie said, I think we do, flooding is really not a huge issue in town. We have big rain events. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm thinking like street flooding, you know, we don't really have a lot of areas that flood uh, over in the streets. Um, a couple times they will, you know, for a few hours at a time, but then they recede. Uh, but if you look at other communities, I think we fare very well in terms of flooding. It's really not, not, the, not a good issue. The only real dam that I, comes to my mind is Logie Lane or the Logie Whitewood area. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I think because I only was reading report summaries, I wasn't here for the development of other plans. Someone had commented about there being, um, maybe it was Main Street, that someone could actually take a canoe down it. Um, and I don't know if that was, no, that was in the that chapter. We don't have a Main Street. I was gonna say. No, well, uh, no, no, I don't know Main Street. I can't, that part I might be wrong, but there was a comment about one of the main, like one of the Main Streets flooding and that you could take a canoe down it and and so I'm just wondering is that an issue that, that was resolved or no. I think no. be like Westfield they had a big mm -hmm. flooding event where you could do it like could, main, yeah. main street Westfield is yeah yeah, yeah. They, yeah we have no. that in Belcher town too they were like <laughs> kayaks going to the street yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, did we uh, change our stormwater bylaw not that long ago it seems to me we went through some maybe the last town meeting I don't know guys we did uh, took over yeah uh, so there were some uh, standards standards that came down through the state through this MSR program so we did update our stormwater bylaws and one thing that we did was um, all of our design storms have now changed so uh, prior to this that the standard was this technical paper 40 stamp TP 40 mm -hmm. uh, which was a document that was I think drafted in the 1960s and, and so our design storms are based on you know these the standards from this 1960 document that never changed in the past 50 years so we've adopted now the it's called atlas 14 it's a NOAA it's a NOAA uh, standard atlas 14 plus um so it's actually it's 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 not a static design number anymore it, it's actually it's it's a moving so after, after every rain event this database gets updated and our design storm changes and so we, we adopted that about a year ago. So the design storms are, you know, that we're designing for new products for, uh, the required developers to design for are much higher than they were before. I think the 24 hour rain event was about six, in, about six inches 
for the 24-hour rain event under the TP40 document, and now it's over 11 inches. That's the design standard. So I think that's a huge step for moving forward for you know having a, a resilient stormwater system. That's a huge step forward. Yeah, I, we're lucky. I know a lot of other towns have had trouble adopting those regulations. I don't know where, where, where Belfort Town was, but we got the bylaw to allow us to do it and then get stuck with having the commission update, you know, do the work to update the regulations. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I think they're still waiting to, because it's just going to be a commission vote, but mm -hmm. now, now I don't do it. I can't. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so we, I think we're, we're in good shape, you know, we're moving forward in that, in that, in that regard. Yeah, that's a really great idea. That's My I'm thoughts really on that, that is if we're in a dry condition such as, well, like right now, we can handle five, five and a half inches of rain without streams or uh, rocks going over bank flow. So, uh, and with hurricanes coming up the coast, if you have a hurricane back to back, then we might be into problems, but we can mm -hmm. handle five inches of rain easy. Over that, we'll start getting into the minor road flooding. And that's a pretty substantially decent sized storm. So that's really great to hear. And then um, what is your funding mechanism for, um, you know, your stormwater, like retrofits, improvements, housekeeping? We have a budget, you know, it's really kind of lumped into all of our mm -hmm. paving and infrastructure projects. Um, so we have a budget for those types of improvements and that would include anything related to um, you know this issue. All right, perfect. All right. So, and I think you'll like. I think you'll like the next question. I'm I'm blanking on your first name. I'm so sorry. Dave. Dave. I have a terrible time with that. It's okay. You'll like the next one. Um, so, in order to meet um, people's energy needs sustainably, energy sources besides fossil fuels must be used because we're running out. But like many rural towns, South Oak is cautious about solar farm development because it can lead to excessive erosion runoff. Um, result in the loss of mature forests and affect the rural vistas in town. What are some ways that Southport can implement alternative energy sources? Um, you know, but have you considered bylaws that limit the location, slope, clearing, and runoff in solar projects townwide? Incentivizing solar as a secondary use, um, things like that, uh, or other alternative energy sources? I don't know. In um, have you got? Have there been any thoughts of that? What would you like to see? I, I don't know what the town's thoughts are. I haven't been mm -hmm. part of any meetings where, you know, alternative energies has really been a focus of conversation. I know when we redid the schools a few years back at the town meeting, I brought it up whether or not there was any plans that were going to be done to make them more uh, sustainable from an energy standpoint. And it seemed to me like there was a rush to get the budget through and get the state funding that they didn't really have time to do any kind of prolonged planning for that. That's mm -hmm. at least the answer that I got. But that being said, I mean, I understand the runoff and the erosion part of it and putting impervious because truly the panels are impervious surfaces, even though underneath they are pervious. So that's there's a balance there. But again, we have a lot of flat roof space already that's mm -hmm. owned by the town that is not going to impact you know any rainfall events and it's not going to uh, impact the water getting into the ground uh, and recharging our wells and aquifers so i would start with using what we have already i don't know if they've been engineered to carry a load like that but you know why not do it a lot of other towns you see where there's already impervious services uh, paved parking lots or what have you they're putting the solar arrays above those. But like a canopy, and then yeah. you don't get the heat island effect from the mm. pavement. And, exactly, yeah. exactly. So you're not, again, you're not taking land to use for solar energy. It's land that's already used, and you're just taking advantage of the space. So I understand there's a cost involved in it. Uh, but again, I don't know if there's ever been a plan to look into it or adopt it. Mm. But I think we should. Um, has the planning board ever considered um, bylaws that would encourage secondary use for solar that would, uh, I think I saw something about a point system for projects and earning points um, is having uh, renewable energy uh, uh, something that would be part of that point system for new projects to, um, or is that something you would consider? I don't think we've got that in our system now. Uh, we have We have a solar bylaw for large scale and, and small scale. Mm -hmm. And that seems to have worked pretty well. 
Uh, we haven't had the issue of land clearing for solar because we have some pretty open areas around town that have been, you know, utilized tobacco areas and uh, some industrial sites that were already cleared. So we haven't run into that issue. I know some of the hill towns were really having major problems with land clearing. Mm -hmm. uh, there was something else about solar. Uh, I guess that was all I had. Yeah, we do have a solar bylaw that's, how's it going, John? We've used <laughs> it uh, a couple times here. Yeah, I think uh, the only the only land clearing one I know that uh, grew into a concern uh, was some internal acreage uh, behind the big Y mm -hmm. uh, here in town. And I think that was more of a, we'll call it a problem or awareness of that change after the fact and due to some, we'll call it uh, loose design and implementation uh, work that allowed runoff mm -hmm. to become a problem for some adjacent residences. Mm -hmm. uh, but to Marcus's point, the other facilities I know that were done on existing large scale improvements. Existing. Yeah, and they happen to be on pretty sandy soil. Yep. So uh, infiltration hasn't been an issue. Uh, the only other thing, getting back to Dave's comment way back, uh, we don't seem to to benefit from the solar installations that are here. Uh, they go into the network, and the, you know whoever has the <laughs> facility is is getting the. Uh, Payments or whatever. Do you and, have pilot? Uh, do you have pilot agreements with the solar? Uh, yeah, it goes through the select board. Okay. And I don't know that whole process. Uh, one of the issues I know, in order to have a solar installation, you need to have the proper uh, power lines. I don't know the terminology. Mm -hmm. You need uh, an interconnection point to attach yeah, to, and I think to the grid. South, yeah. we, we're limited. I know there's a gentleman on South Loomis that has some open land that he would like to get a solar installation on, but he can't because of the power uh, system, the network. Yep. So, and I don't know if there's a long range plan by Eversource to upgrade, uh, you know, so they can focus into areas. I mean, we might be able to direct them and say, please, not please, but upgrade your lines in this area because this is where uh, we see potential installations. Large scale is required to be in industrial or industrial restricted zones. So right off the bat, then we know where they are. Uh, we should put the power in that area, I don't know. But, but that's a really, I mean, but you bring up a good point about potentially asking Eversource because they may not look at, okay, they, they may be looking at the whole statewide system and think, well, increasing our whole, you know, capacity for interconnection is insurmountable. But if you have independent, like small relationships with individual people, you might, that they might pay attention with a request from a town. And I can't say they would or would not, but can't hurt to ask. Um, because you're right, the, the the lack of interconnections. There's a lot of solar projects that have been permitted and are ready to go, but they can't get connected to the grid. And I and, think that's a requirement a in our bylaw. We they have to the applicant has to show that they have the inner or the connection. The interconnection. Yep. Makes sense. Otherwise, it's just a bunch of glass panels in the field. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. Pretty shiny yeah. mirrors. <laughs> um, so social resiliency is oftentimes overlooked um, and the MVP planning process showed that people had concerns regarding outreach and support for senior citizens, having community events and outdoor recreation. How does the town currently reach out to seniors, disabled folks and other potentially isolated populations? And what goals should the town have to better build social resiliency in these potentially isolated groups of people? Um, you know, do you use different techniques, uh, similar or different techniques when you're promoting community events, food trucks um, on the common, motocross, you know, how, how do you guys reach out to, to your folks to let them know that there's things going on? Or to let them know what the services are in town so that people can, you know, rely on their social networks? Being a senior, I will say that our council on aging is proactive. It's great to hear. We do have an aging population in Southwood. Right, Ken? 
yes. and statistics or whatever yes. you pulled out of the yeah uh, from the census census has showed that so uh, what's the know, percent people I'm curious to you since know. um more than a quarter um I think it's 28. 20, above the age 65 above age 65. Hmm. now how does that compare to national or state um i mean the population is getting older so I, I think with regards to the rest of the county it's right it's a little less it's a little more than i think tw between 22 and 25 i think is the county um yeah i have to get back to you on it that but years. Sorry. We did have that focus group, Aging in Southwick, that uh, Council on Aging yeah. facilitated, and that was a very good discussion. Uh, you know, how do we take care of older people who are living in home, in home single family homes mm -hmm. scattered mm -hmm. around the town? Uh, fire department, I think they've had uh, helping with uh, CO2 detectors and fire. There's sand bucket brigade. Yeah. Sand, they provided sand, whatever. What was that exactly? Sand bucket brigade. It give bring in five gallon pails of sand for sidewalks oh. or that's fantastic. As a senior outreach effort? Is it, is that I don't know. I'd never partake oh, okay. partook in it. But I'm aware of it. Yeah. And then uh, uh, street identification or street numbers. They have oh, a fall right. cleanup as well, uh, fall like leaf and uh, leaf cleanup. So it sounds like that the COA really does do a great job of not just reaching out to seniors, but actually having activities, things to do, encouraging oh, yeah. people to regularly get out there. That's fantastic. Um, is there anything that mimics that, that reaches out to people, say, who have disabilities, mental health concerns, maybe are not native English speakers? Um, you know, people who might other otherwise be um, isolated from, you know, the town structure. HIPAA laws have a lot to do with that. And under emergency management, I am not aware of the people with disabilities that might need services in case of uh, natural disasters or mm -hmm. emergencies. Mm -hmm. So it is, are there any disability advocacy groups in town, um, even any high school um, groups that might have people that have um, disabilities, mental health concerns, um, LGBTQ, those, um, are there any of those groups that reach out to, that the town coordinates with? I am unaware. Oh. There, there would be special needs and we're a regional school district, so we're kind of a little bit government separated. Mm -hmm. I know from, so I have children with disabilities, and I know when they went through the school system, there were no organizations. It was mm -hmm. all family advocating, right? So there was yep. nothing. I mean, they have special needs departments like all schools do, but there weren't any specific groups geared towards any of the uh, um, people you're talking about. All right. That could have changed. It's been a few years. But I think that maybe that speaks to a need in the social resiliency category that um, Southwick is doing a fabulous job with reaching out to its senior citizens, but that there may be other um, climate vulnerable populations that we can reach out to people who um, who are living in poverty, people with disabilities, um, physical and mental, people who um, are socially isolated, oftentimes in uh, minority status groups. Um, that would be another place for social resiliency to be, to be focused on, um, you know, because you guys are doing great with the, with the senior groups, but, um, you know, that's, that's another group, bunch of people that traditionally get overlooked. Mm -hmm. So, all right. If I, if I could, Erica. Yeah. So I just um, pulled up, Marcus reminded me of the presentation that um, our colleague Becky Bash put together for the senior, um, the Council on Aging um, listening session, and in 2010, um, according to the 2010 census, 13% of the Southwood population was 65 plus. In 2020, it's now 22%. So it has grown um, and it's growing. Um, so that's just for some context.
Excellent. All set? Thank you. Awesome. Um, let's see, outdoor recreation on water bodies and waterways. It's been impacted by algal blooms in the past. Um, what steps is South Creek taking now to manage the health of its recreational water bodies? Um, you know, algal blooms, nutrient counts, anything, you know, E. coli, fecal coliform. And um, what do you think they should be, you should be doing for the next 10 to 20 years to ensure that they can still be safe for recreation? Do you wanna... I'll just... start. Oh, oh, go ahead. I, I don't want to, so we have a lake management committee that is very active and been very proactive in monitoring and improving the water quality around the lakes. Um, one of the big things the town did about 25 years ago was sewers, um, all the, most of the lake roads. And then even since then, this LMC group has been very active in monitoring. They, they're, they've done a lot. Um, there was, uh, uh, there have been historically algae bloom, blooms and, you know, I would say every year, but most years, um, there was, um, what type of treatment was it? An alum? It was an alum treatment two years yeah. ago. Yeah. And since that point, there have not been any. That's only been two years, but uh, there weren't any algae boom the last two years. And they do have a you know, long-term plan. Um, it's a very costly plan, and they're looking for funding to do a full dredging of the lakes, which they think will uh, you know, basically reset the clock back to day one. Um, in terms of lake quality, but that's you know that that's a battle for funding. But in, in the meantime, they have done a lot um, in terms of what they can to improve their water quality. That's impressive. Terrific. I would also say just to kind of give some people credit, we also have a uh, private advocacy group for the the lakes as well that get together and work in conjunction with lake management and other departments in town to just make sure that the water quality and um, actually the water quality and the health and behavior on the lake is addressed. So pretty active community there as well. That's wonderful. One of the most pressing needs they, they push for now is uh, dredging, not just the lake, but dredging at least the canal. The outlet? The outlet. Yep. The outlet, yes. So the way it, the canal is, is basically, it's, you know, it is blocked, it is clogged. So it's not acting as an outlet anymore. It's actually reversing flow in some situations. And the challenge too on that one is it could be an interstate issue because it goes right into Connecticut. So on the on the south end, and of course the Great Brook is the other outflow, but that's like a huge project to try to clean out that uh, and restore the flow on that. Mm -hmm. I don't know where are they anywhere with that one. A lake management. They uh, they've been trying to get fun funding through state and federal agencies, and it's you know it's a it's a it's a battle. Yeah, yeah I thought Dick was getting somewhere on that though. At least from the communications I've seen, it seems like there's Stop. been some forward movement on it. I don't know yeah. the latest and greatest, but I know he's pretty diligent about it. And I think there's a couple things on uh, on the web site. Uh, was it Russell Fox did an interview with uh, Dr. Muller? Muller? Muller, yeah. Muller? Muller, Muller. Uh, all about the lake. And then uh, during the budget hearing, I have to watch a piece of that. And uh, they, both Dick and Dr. Muller, kind of gave an overview when they were pretty positive about the status of the algae blooms and uh, then kind of went over some of the funding sources or money they're hoping that will come in to do some of that dredging and talked about, you know, hundreds of years of accumulation, maybe thousands of years of accumulation of debris on the, on the bottom of the lake. How do you clean that out? Because there's not much, I guess, water movement water sits in the lake for quite a while. Yeah. This past issue, there were some E. coli. Past summer, there were a lot of E. coli hits in the lake. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't know if, was that, if the source was ever identified. Um, I mean, we had, we had geese. 
we didn't have mm -hmm. a, a lot of rain events and we were in a drought it's really hot so concentrated yeah and, things yeah. were just sort of stagnant and I and then think, when it did rain you got all the runoff taking all the surface contaminants and yeah yeah are you having problems with uh non-point source discharges into the lakes you're getting a lot of sheet flow that picks up um fertilizer things like that what? goose I poop i don't know how to how do you mm, measure extra that. good fertilizer right mm. well i mean there's Again, the topography of the lake that Sabrina was talking about before, there's mm -hmm. a lot of high points around it, right? Mm -hmm. So everybody that's around it that's throwing fertilizer on their lawns, mm -hmm. obviously at some point that's running down into the lake. You know, how yeah. measurable it is, I, I don't know. And there's, you know, some agriculture in proximity, but not a lot that sits right at the lake's edge. So I don't know what the impact of those are as well. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, there's something to say that like, so 100, 100 years ago, we had really good water quality. It's spring fed mostly. Mm -hmm. um, and what's changed over the past 100 years? Well, all the houses, yep. all the houses and, you know, lawns, all that vegetation around the lake that has been removed. And, you know, so you do have that pollutants coming in and also um, the water is coming into the lake a lot faster when we have those rain events because mm -hmm. there's nothing really holding that back yeah so definitely um, that's something that i would like to see in the future maybe at least just education around so the lake about, to like slow release fertilizers how very how little you actually need to use and yeah yeah, yeah. i think that's that sounds like a really yeah. great goal one of the concerns is build up of forever chemicals Mm. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that has been addressed in our LAPC meetings. Sorry, what does LAPC stand for? I don't know what Local it's Emergency in. Planning Committee uh, on Hazardous uh, Material transported, used, and stored in our community. Extremely hazardous, like boom, boom. Yeah, it makes me nervous. <laughs> I don't know where it fits in, but I know for several years we've been trying to get green community designation. Mm -hmm. and, yep. And it uh, seems to me we're close. I don't know what, I know at one time it was the stretch code, the building code that was the bugaboo that we couldn't get past. People wouldn't accept, you know, the higher standards for building construction, but I haven't heard much uh, about that issue. So maybe we're close to getting to that. I would be curious to know what makes us close. You know, I, cause I, again, I don't think I've seen any concerted effort to, to be significantly well, I think I think so, I did So there's read, an application yeah. open now. Yeah. I think actually the town is applying. I think it's actually within the next five couple of weeks. If it hasn't already been submitted, it will be. I think end of the month. I Who's think. doing that, Randy? Art Lawler is spearheading that. Art is the former building inspector. Yeah. So I was on communications with Art and others in town over the past two or three weeks, um, trying to wrap up that application. And things they were talking about were commitments to upgrade our street lights to LED lights. Uh, purchasing um, electric vehicles or, or hybrid vehicles, um, upgrading HVAC systems and other you know heating systems and municipal buildings. Yeah. So there is a there is an effort to become designated mm -hmm. as a green community. So I know we've talked about like green uh, electric electronic uh, electric charging stations. I mean, is that part of it as well? I mean, if we're going to have hybrid and electric vehicles, we need to charge them, and we don't have any. I don't know the all sides do that. Yeah. There yeah. is a state grant for the installation material cost and installation costs. Talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think there's a there's a big carrot. I think I can't manage them once I get them, do but you I drive, can find them. <laughs> do you drive an electric vehicle? No, I do not. If you get I can't, you know, trying to drive on to work sites and out oh, in the woods. Yeah. I, I really needed months. actually like an SUV, which killed. But yeah, um, I needed. That's, that's the, that's You're just like crying. Yes, I'm like, you were like, but it's so comfortable, but I shouldn't like it. <laughs> and they're happening torture. Been exactly. things that done, done, the town has done over the past few years that helped with this application. You know, think of like the, all the buildings, I think, were all updated with LED lights, yep. internal. 
Um, some of our water and sewer pump stations are updated with um, uh, VFE drives, which are a little more um, lower usage. So things that we there are things that we have done, um, and I think we're I think I'm optimistic that we'll get there. You think you're in a good position for the application? Yeah, I, I, there was uh, some last minute finagling, um, but I think I think we are comfortable submitting and seeing where it goes. That's fantastic news. It's great to hear because reading reading the chapter as it read uh, previously um, for this, it was that you know there was a lot of effort being made made, and it mentioned some of the things that you were discussing about efforts to move towards it, but that it hadn't hadn't been um, voted and approved. And I that must have been the building code part that was the issue. So it's really nice to hear that it is actually moving forward. Is that building code just for a municipality building or like all new builds? All new buildings. Yeah, I think go would go through the. Planning. New building inspector. Building inspector. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, extra insulation and right. tight, tighter houses and mm -hmm. lots of things like that. Testing of it. All right. Well, we are coming to the end and we are reaching. Oh, we're doing pretty good on the timing, too. Um, so I, my last question would be is. Um, that the town should be aspiring to meet the goals in this comprehensive plan over the lifespan of that, which is about 10 to 20 years. Um, is there anything that you really think should be a top goal in terms of climate resiliency and sustainability? Any overarching idea that we haven't discussed, something you want to see promoted? Um, this is your chance to let me know. Is there something that should have a greater emphasis that we did discuss? Excuse me, uh, Dennis Clark here. Hi, Dennis. How are you doing? I don't know if I missed it, but far, uh, Southwick is a farming community, and this has had a great effect on the farmers in our town. And I see you do have Bert Hansen, the uh, chair of the Agricultural Commission. Uh, he would probably know more about it, but I know the farmers have been greatly impacted. And would like to be able to see, you know, as far as the droughts, the, the whole situation is going on, if there's something that could be incorporated into a plan to help the farmers out to keep them alive. Maybe Bert That's could uh, address that. Uh, do you need my name and address on this? <laughs> no, no, no. You just have to speak up first. No. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, just to echo what Dennis is saying, it's really a question at this point. What can we do as a commission or as a town government <clears throat> to help farmers mitigate these these changes, you know, this, the, the severe weather events and their frequency of them, and as Charlie said, the sort of the deeper cycles. I don't know the answer to that sitting here right now, but um, it's something we definitely need to to address. <clears throat> have, have any of the farmers discussed alternative crops to grow? You know, that maybe mm -hmm. can uh, endure drier, hotter temperatures yeah not that i'm aware of um there's still a lot of interest in tobacco obviously uh which is very very profitable <laughs> um, um and the you know the vegetable farmers you know the calabrises and the <clears throat> and the you know blossoming acres they're just doing what they're doing um i don't and i know there's some some question of course about growing hemp uh, which is not legal right now on any <clears throat> any land that is under a state um, like 61A protection or federal protection because it's illegal federal. Well, well, hemp itself can be. It's the cannabis with THC that cannot. So you can grow the CBD hemp without THC in it because that is federally legal. So we had the hemp farm. Yep. Right up no, there. that's not true. That's not true. You can't. It can't be in six. That you can't on uh, 61A land you can't grow hemp, and on uh, APR land you are not you can't grow hemp. It's illegal right now. The, the uh, they, uh, Department of Agriculture uh, came down and said that you can grow cannabis pro products on APR land now. That came what down about this, this was about 12 months ago. Um, so I can actually get you the decision from the Department of Agriculture. Um, not hemp being federally legal without THC in it. Is that's what we're saying is is, is a different um, you don't need any kind of permission to do that, but if it has THC in it, chapter 61 cannot do it, but APR lands can. 
Well, it all does, all, it all has a certain amount of THC. It's a very small, tiny, uh, but if you could get us that information, it would help Bert out tremendously because we have people in town that uh, would like to do that. And I have been, uh, up to this point, have been unable to either put it in 61A or APR land. But thank you very much for that. Uh, yeah, no, I'll get you the decision because the previous town I worked in, we also had quite a few farmers who were interested. It can make a, a farm that's really struggling into something that's profitable. I'll send that it, over. Yeah. It, it, the other thing, I know there's grants out there for uh, creating some kind of ponds, you know, some kind of irrigation ponds for the farmers. If we could, you know, work that into our schedule, try to get help them with those grants to be able to get some more irrigation on those properties. Mm -hmm. Has there been any discussion about promoting water reuse that if you have a barn, anything with a roof that you're collecting the water into a cistern for irrigation later? Has there been any discussion about that? Well, I know that some towns do the, uh, you know, they collect the water from the roofs and they can uh, have rain barrels. You know, there are, I don't think our town, Randy, we don't have that through our DBW, do we, the rain barrels? Uh -huh. Not now, no. No, but has that been um, discussed with any of the farmers, whether that might be a way to get through agriculture? Sorry, go ahead. My name is Sankar Goberdon. I'm the Ag Commission as well. Um, there are a few farmers who are actually doing this ad hoc and have been doing it for a few years. Um, I feel in Bert's point of view, um, again, it's just a general outreach from some farmers that I've connected with, wanting more information about more efficient ways of collecting rainwater. Mm -hmm. um, potentially also kind of using different sorts of channeling and irrigation methods. There's a lot out there. It's just that in terms of bandwidth, farmers have limited time and they want experts to come in. So when they have communicated this need, this interest, ultimately it's come down to kind of us as an adcom or me as an individual trying to find um, a connection. But I think organizing as a town, potentially, um, workshops with experts and maybe getting grant money mm -hmm. to fund these workshops and letting farmers know there would be attendance for sure if we guaranteed it to be something you know compact informative they would definitely attend because there are these questions they are suffering firsthand um, and they know the methods are out there they've seen how people across the world are adapting to this but it just feels like they don't know who to go to um, and I also just wanted to echo something else that Bert mentioned. Uh, um, some farmers have also um, asked me if there's different methods or connections that we have that could help them understand different forms of agriculture, like silviculture, mm -hmm. incorporating more forested land onto um, existing open space of farmland, as well as um, a little bit more information about breaking away from the monoculture uh, methodology things like centropic agriculture. These are pretty specialized fields. We have people in town who are from farming um, families, so they have the know-how in terms of the land. It's just that the science behind some of the uh, crops and the rotation and understanding how to be mindful of soil in a world that's changing with climate. Again, we don't, like I'll send them to a resource like, uh, you know, Land for Good. They may have some workshops coming up or, um, no from Northeastern organization, organic uh, farming organization in New England. They always have like a cadre of experts, but ultimately they always come back to me and say, I don't have time to attend that. Is there something going on at town hall that I can attend? So I think just centralizing it here, making it hyper local, hyper accessible is important because I think that, you know, they're doing some research, they're seeing things on Facebook, they're asking about these new methods and they want to, um, have local you know resources it's just that sometimes even with grant writing there's a gap to make that next week um, yeah. some of them are confident in grant writing either so just having some sort of bureau here adcom or otherwise that can be active and connect them and say hey we have this workshop coming on water collection or um centropic agriculture I think that's going to make the change because they're interested. It's just that right now, the field on the side, it feels a little barren in terms of resources. Yeah. Of being a farming, right to farm community, it's just a little uncomfortable. And so they're working not, on it, yeah. obviously.
And they're not alone in, in that feeling. There's definitely a lot of other agricultural communities that are, are very innovative farmers, um, and the resources and the support and the education isn't there for them to do these great ideas that they have, and they just can't implement it through no fault of their own. So you're right, yeah. Right. And that's I love the idea of centralized workshops. I think yeah, that's a great one. Yeah. Even with the hemp, you know, there's been a few people who said, okay, now that we can farm hemp, it has all of these good qualities in terms of kind of soil degeneration. How can we grow hemp and also grow flowers that I'm going to sell as annuals or other food crops? Because I've seen people do it in other parts of the country. So how can I do that? Right, right. It's like you send them a website, but it's not the same thing as having actually someone in person, an expert come in. So I think we as a town could certainly facilitate that. So. Thank you. That's great feedback. Thank you. Just one more quick thing yeah. to build on what you were saying. We're just um, <clears throat> kind of scratching the surface of these issues right now, but I do want to sort of get on the record uh, saying that we're doing um, outreach to the farmers a lot more proactively than we have in the past. Um, we are uh, working with the library, for example, to set up some grant writing workshops. Um, and uh, we actually have some farmers coming to the AgCon meetings now, so that's... <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you bring up a really good point, and it's been throughout the conversation regarding, regardless of the topics that we've talked about, and a lot of it comes back to grant writing, right? Yeah. And I know we've talked about this at the master planning meetings and what have you, and again, I don't, I don't think we're unusual from a lot of other communities, but we don't have a lot of expertise in grant writing in certain pockets. I know we get grants and DPW does a good job of getting grants, but from like a conf conservation standpoint, ag, what have you, it would be nice to have some local knowledge about A, where the grants are, and B, how to write grants. Because there is a ton of money out there, just like college scholarships. There's a lot out there. You just got to know how to get them, yeah. right? And that's the problem. It's a skill. So if you're going to have that meeting regarding grant writing at the library, can you please let other departments know about that? Because there's a there's a need permeating the entire town hall for that. Mm -hmm. And you may find that any of your neighboring towns, that if you have the space for attendance, you may get people from your neighboring towns who would quite happily travel for that kind of a workshop. Um, it is, it's, it's a need. And there's a whole industry where people pay lots of money to learn how to write grants. And it'd be really nice to have that available without paying lots of money. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> um, something that we didn't touch up on also, you do have a map here, environmental constraints to development, and it does talk about um, the priority habitat of rare species and mm -hmm. estimated habitat of, of rare wildlife. As far as conservation, I would like to um, see us sort of try to, if we can, obtain some of these areas and conserve them for, well, as far as like um, water quality, habitat, even um, air purification, that sort of thing. Um, just in the test, past 10 years, I've noticed that the air quality isn't the same here in Southwood. Um, there's a lot of more, more particulates in the air. I live on one side on the, I live on South Pond and I can see Suffield. And usually it, it's quite clear, like back, back when I was growing up, it's a clear view. And now I, I can notice there's a haze even in the winter time, which is just not not normal, at least for me. Um, and Kevin. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I could use it. Oh. And I don't know if this, if this falls along sustainability and climate resiliency, but um, and I've mentioned this in in some of the past meetings as far as light pollution. I think he just mm -hmm. talked about the LED lights and everything. So light pollution, um, we used to be able to see the Milky Way 10, 15 years ago. We can't, well, at least where I live, and I can't, I can't see it anymore. So that's something that um, thinking about as far as replacing our street lights, because a lot of that is municipality lights that are, are doing mm -hmm. that. And from other communities as well, like West Springfield and everything, but you know, do we have a, I would imagine we have a lighting bylaw that basically, is there anything that mandates you keep the light on your property? Uh, from private property, yes. Yeah. Yes. But not 
Town property? I don't think that applies to town property. There is a, it's a newer policy it's called Dark Skies mm -hmm. policy. They, everything should be shining down. Yeah. So mm -hmm. the newer lights, they, 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 they meet that Dark Skies policy. Okay. What about the, the color of the light? Is it? The color. So yeah, you see a lot of the lights now, they got like an orangey color to them. Yeah, yep. Um, actually, it's the, um, <coughs> is it, I think it's the Kelvin? It's the blue? The kind of blue in the light. Yeah. So there's a range. Yep. They could be the one to talk about this to me, but it, there is. Um, we would put a light. You know, we we have, we we have plenty. If we'd ever do a street light conversion, we have lights that we would like to do that would have that lower blue light, which you know, and it also shines down, so mm -hmm. it wouldn't impact you know viewing up to the sky. So the blue light, I think, is actually it negatively impacts insects. Yes, um, and, our, and, and our humans as well. Yeah, so why can't we have it more of the warm light? So we're looking for like kind of in the, in the, in the middle. Something so, in the yeah, middle. Yeah, so I think there's a Kelvin number. I think it's when the LEDs, a lot of they first came out, their blue lights were like around 4,000 Kelvin. Mm -hmm. um, and then the technology's gotten better where that Kelvin number has gotten dropped down. And I think we'd be looking at someone that two to two thousand twenty five hundred Kelvin number of lights. It's good to know you're thinking about that. My big concern is new developments, the quick runoff mm -hmm. from roofs, driveways, mm -hmm. where the water increases the flow in the brooks and into the lakes, whether it's not permeated into the soil. And for new developments, I'd like to see probably maybe some more mosquito pits or something to retain the water from a quick runoff. I have a brook that runs under my driveway, and I notice that the storm runoff is a lot faster with each new to ho new house that's developed. And that would like the uh, rain barrels mm -hmm. would be you know, but. It is of a concern. I've seen it since 1976 increase substantially. Yeah. One other thing I also want to think is important to know, I don't know the answer, but Charlie mentioned mosquitoes, mm -hmm. but not only mosquitoes and also ticks. We've seen a lot of increase in ticks over the past mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. I've already pulled ticks off me this year. Yeah. Um, and there's a new disease spread by the black legged tick. Yay. Mm. Yay. So, I heard that there's an invasive species, the barberry, and when there's higher concentrations of barberry, yeah, bear, yep. there's higher concentrations of ticks. The ticks love the Japanese barberry, yeah. and, it's, and it's evil and spiky and needs to just die. We have a lot of it yeah. on the Sofanowski property. I'd love to kill it. Oh, really? Yeah. I would love it. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't realize there was so much of it. Believe it or not, barberry is excellent in responding to flame weeding. So, what does that mean? Like, just burning, burning. them? You, oh yeah, you take a blowtorch and you light the Go. ball of the the roof ball and you light it till it glows. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you can see the conservation agents are like, yeah. Take a job. So if you start doing an invasive management program out there, you know who to call. Okay. <laughs> so I'm just gonna call you everything. <laughs> um, yeah, but no, the mosquitoes and ticks are a real concern in terms of, you know, public health hazards. Um, mm -hmm. Is there, has anyone ever thought about, do they do a mosquito control program in town? Is there, um, is that happening? The mosquito control board, are they active here? I know that's a countywide. Um, no, we're not we with opted out of that? <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure, because you can opt out of the mosquito control from the yeah. state. Yeah. I think we're not a part of that program. I think we've opted out. Do you know any no, of the wiser people? What? I can always check. Yeah, too. yeah I think yeah. I'm not sure because I just recently did a, a webinar in regards to Mosquito and I want to say that they had a map up of all of the towns who were opted out. It was an old map and I want to say Southwick was opted out. I don't know. I'll look it up. I'll check it out. Yeah. Um, has anyone made any, had any thoughts about tick control? Any, um, like they will oftentimes have like deer feeding stations that they have the permethrin and when they stick their head into the bucket, it touches their neck and the permethrin kills the ticks or um, has, there, has there been any 
thoughts about that or no, no? I don't even know that it existed. Like my, my grandparents made a very smart investment in 82 and bought a house on Nantucket before it was Nantucket. And they have a lot of ticks and deers over there. And they yeah, that's how yeah. they that's how they control the ticks as much as they can is they, they have like little you know, like little vertical brushes they look like and they just kind of stick their head and they get permethrin on them and hmm. yeah. yeah. So, all right. But they taste different after that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're not supposed to eat the fur. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Anyone else have any other things they want to make sure I get down? Any found from the public? Oh. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm glad you guessed here. My name is Debbie Ranjo, 228 Cross Anderson. Um, I've been taking notes, so I'm going to go back a little bit. I keep my mouth shut. Um, there was, when we were talking about the first question, there was some slight mess, mention about um, about burying the power line. And it seems to me that it's, it's long been kind of dismissed because it is expensive and it is, and there are a lot of reasons. But having lived in a home that had buried power lines for 47 years, and not ever once. And I live on Cross Anderson Road, which is a wooded area in town. I have not ever once had trouble with those very lines. Um, oh, the trouble is always with the lines in the neighborhood or elsewhere, cutting off the power. And it seems to me that we could look more open-mindedly at burying those power lines as it comes up. I know years ago we did a complete redo of, of the highway in the center of town, put in the sewers and water and all that kind of stuff. It would have been a prime time to bury the line, <laughs> but it didn't happen. But it seems to me that if we had a plan to do that as the roads are repaired or redone, it might make sense. And in the long run, I think it would save us a lot of money. Um, Never mind the aesthetics of it. That's a whole other issue. Um, that one point I wanted to make. Another is that um, we we talked about tree cutting along along the roads for good reason, as Sabrina pointed out. Sometimes trees need to come down. Um, but it, when we bought our house, one of the selling points was that. Cross Anderson Road is a scenic road in town. It's a designated scenic road. And I know Pine Road is, there are others. And I'm wondering what happened to that program with the scenic road, because it doesn't seem to me, from my observation, that anybody knows anything about which roads are scenic roads or how they're supposed to be protected or what's allowed and what's not allowed um, until it's too late. You know, and then the walls are deconstructed and the trees are down and, and oh, that was supposed to be a scenic road. Um, so, and I wonder how that, how that goes along with the tree cutting for the power lines. Um, if, if there's a balance or if there's any limitation for that. I can uh, respond. So there is a, um... There is a list of scenic roads and towns, one you mentioned, the ones you mentioned plus more. Right. Um, and, you know, if I had to do a project on a scenic road, I would go to the planning board uh, under the scenic road bylaw and there'd be a hearing for that. I've been before the planning board a few times. Um, <clears throat> I can tell you that Eversource and utility companies are exempt from that scenic uh -huh. road bylaw. So they do not have to go through that process. Okay. Thank you. That that answers. Yeah. Well, there are there are trees that I as a tree warden I can designate a tree as a hazard tree on a scenic road, and I can have that tree removed without going through the public the, the public hearing. Okay. All right. Um. Thank you. That clears that up. Um. And then my third question was about long range planning in terms of our roads and and highways again. If we're looking at alternative um, energy, you know, getting away from gas-powered engines and electric vehicles and that kind of thing, 
or even more bicycle use, pedestrian areas. It seems I don't see much in the long range planning that accommodates for that. Yeah, we have a bicycle trail, but from where I live, there's almost no place in town I can go without driving my car. And there are not sidewalks in many of the communities and the neighborhoods. There are not um, bicycle safe lanes to, to ride a bike. Even just, you know, I don't have an e-bike. I wish I did. But to, to ride a bike in to pick up a pizza and bring it back or something like that, it's just not safe in most places in town. And I'm thinking about, um, again, 20 years out, if we could have have roads and byways that are safe for walking and, and biking, maybe we wouldn't have to rely so heavily on gas-powered engines. So, you know, we are talking about, uh, Randy mentioned the uh, green community application and purchasing e-vehicles. I think we passed up an opportunity to do that several years ago with this now. Um, but I, I think we need we need to think more broadly about redesigning our community. In that case, I know there's been discussion about a, a new downtown area where you can walk from one shop to another. So this, you know, which that's to me that's all part of the climate change and resiliency and sustainability. Um, is the overall design of the community. Uh, I'd like to see more discussion on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Julia Hansen, uh, 153 North Landing Road. I just wanted to make a comment about the um, senior, the section you had on the seniors. Mm -hmm. um, because I do, I take care, and I don't take care of them, but I'm a companion to a couple of elderly women. Um, neither of them have um, working cell phones, and they don't have any interest in get, getting a new one. And they don't have computers, and they don't get newspapers, not that there's a lot in, in the newspaper for us, but that's one of the problems if you don't belong to the senior center and you can't get there, um, and, and I give the senior center a lot of credit. Um, you know, that's how I got um, com got coupled with one person, and they are really so great at at um, getting the word out there. But if you're not part of the senior center, it's very difficult for some of these people to get to know what's going on and what the resources are. I mean, in terms of um, one woman that I was taking care of. You know, she didn't even, I mean, and she's in her 80s, and she wasn't aware of um, Meals on Wheels. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think that's just, I don't, I don't know what the answer to is, because people don't get newspapers anymore, except we, us. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what the answer is to that, you know, but I think that some, for some people who live alone um, or in the outer reaches of the community, they just don't really know what the advantages are for them. So I just wanted to The that. senior center has a monthly mailing, I believe, to the seniors. So maybe they're not registered. They're um, not. You're right. You have to register to get on that. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I, but that's, again, a way. But it's also part of the issue. If you don't know you need to register, you don't get the newsletter. Yeah. So how do you know you need to do this to get the information? Yeah. 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 That's it. You're right. That's a, it's a barrier. But, yeah. You know, once you do register with the senior center, they are great at letting you know what's going on, and they have great opportunities for so, so many ranges of the senior age group. <laughs> How do you register? You just go in and you like say downstairs. I want to register and you get a new car. Right down below you, one floor down. Yeah. Yeah. You it's sign enough early? Yeah. <laughs> 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 
do a lot of fun things. So. Yeah, you're just looking for something well, to fill like, your days. Why don't they have a 30s and 40s party? Oh my god, I love that. Right? I'm like, I, I'm like, I have no social life now. Oh. <laughs> it is a kind of isolation. We're buckling down, right? Y yes, yes. Yep. I hear you. All right. Anyone else have any thoughts, comments? I, I will say to... Um, everyone again thank you for your participation today um i think it's very informative um we i think erica took a lot um i definitely took a lot of notes um <laughs> but the the i think you know as some points were brought up towards the end um those are components of other parts of the master plan that definitely will be addressed with regards to um, pedestrian and the long range planning for roads and byways um but yeah, uh, your your participation is instrumental to this process, and I think um, as we continue on um, and start having the committee look over drafts and having the community look over that, and then talking about implementation in the next couple of months, will um, you know we arrive at a at a plan that the community hopefully the planning board will approve, <laughs> um, and um, yeah, go from there. But it would be embarrassing if it didn't. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I know that the master plan committee uh, advisory committee meets the first and third Thursdays of the month um, in the evening they're hybrid. It's great. I love coming to town hall to, to attend those and hear from everyone. Um, but I urge you just, you know, to, to stay engaged as we continue on, um, because the next couple of months are going to be the, it's like, now we hear, we heard about the issues and we've heard about the focus groups now it's like what are our strategies to to tackle that mm -hmm. um and we're gonna have some great conversations i think over the next couple of meetings well thank you yeah too. no no thank you guys it was this was really really productive and, and and enjoyable and if i may ask our four residents if you feel comfortable may i ask is there a sign and board over there? Um, no, that was, I took that. That was for conservation. Oh, I took okay. That away. All right. Well, is there any chance that you wouldn't mind signing in just so that we can be like, here's our record of all the people who attended our meetings? Yeah. Um, it just, it's like, look, we do have public participation. We do care about your opinions. Mm, we listen. <laughs> Will we act on them? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's a different thing that's, altogether. That's something you keep to yourself. Yeah. Oh, oh. Yeah. Sorry. Dave, this is being recorded for posterity. <laughs> right. <laughs> Dennis, so that's the first time I put my foot in my mouth. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Dennis. I would love to have that in the package for our next meeting. So the conservation. So that we can review that. Yes, we are with the committee. The water resources? No, no, no. I thought I passed you the 